So uh, Wired Magazine recently named Donald Trump one of the 13 most dangerous people on the internet. Fortune Magazine recently named our next speaker one of the world's 50 greatest leaders. The president says he was a successful businessman. He founded Trump University, Trump Steaks, Trump Vodka. Our next speaker is the past winner of the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and he's the only former CEO of a publicly traded company serving in the House. Uh, both have been called long shots. Donald Trump made his way through the Republican primary using negativity and divisiveness. Our next speaker is out there every day with a message that our country can embrace positive politics and emphasizing solutions over problems and cooperation over division. And while President Obama uh, said he saw himself as a New Dem, and President Clinton certainly came from a New Dem perspective, our next speaker is the first member of the New Dem coalition uh, in the U.S. House to run for president. He's running on a platform that believes you can be both pro-growth and pro-worker, that we have more in common than what makes us different. And it is my honor to introduce you to a great leader and a great friend, Please welcome Representative John Delaney. Uh, well, thank you, Derek. You know, I always say that um, when Derek Kilmer walks on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives, the average SAT score goes up materially. And that's not just because you give me very nice introductions, but uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for all you do. Thank you for being such a terrific colleague. Uh, and thank you even more for the friendship. It's really, uh, it's been a great experience. And that's the thing, for those of you who are new to the New Dems, um, it really is like a family. We all get along really well, we support each other. And it's not just because we have a kind of a common view of policy, but I think it's much deeper than that. I think we have a very similar orientation as to why we all entered public service. And I think that what brings us together at our core, we're in it for the right reasons. I want to thank Scott Peters for organizing this great conference with Jim Himes, who I think may have left us, and all the other New Dems that are here. It's great to be with you. And I am running for president, which means I spend a lot of time in Iowa and New Hampshire. I've done uh, 19 trips to those two states since I announced uh, last August, excuse me, including the uh, trip that I just got back from early this morning. I left Iowa at about 5 a.m. this morning, so I apologize for that. But, um, and I've done 180 events in those two states. I've been to 58 of the 99 counties uh, in Iowa. And it's been an amazing experience, not only just to introduce myself to these very sophisticated voters in these two states, but also, and this is obviously the most important aspect of this job, is to listen to what they have to say. And I've learned so much from all of these events that I've done. And I'll just tell you one little story that I think frames our discussion here today uh, quite well. And the discussion was really terrific. You guys did an amazing job getting such intelligent panelists to talk to us today. So again, uh, kudos to everyone involved, JD and the rest of the team. But this story um, is from a visit I had in a town called Winterset, Iowa, which is about an hour outside of Des Moines. And it was maybe six weeks ago and it was Saturday evening at 8 p.m. at a pizza ranch restaurant. And they have these, these pizza-themed, or these ranch-themed pizza restaurants all over Iowa. And Winterset is, is famous because it's John Wayne's birthplace. They have a nice museum for him there. And so we settled in for this meeting with the Winterset Democratic Club, and there were 15 of them. And the head of the Winterset Democratic Club was a, a, a guy in his late 40s who was a union electrician. And my dad was a union electrician. So he and I were, were getting along well. And as the meeting started, he said, we're all Bernie people here. And he looked down at the table at his 14 other colleagues, and one young woman put up her hand, and she said, no, I was with Hillary. And I said, well, I was with Hillary, too. And um, he said, that's right, you were with Hillary, but the rest of us were, were Bernie people. So I said, <clears throat> so you really like Bernie? He goes, yeah, I love Bernie, but I didn't agree with all his policies. So I said, I thought that was interesting. So I said, well, what didn't you agree with Senator Sanders on? And he said, well, single payer health care. He said, I'm in a union, and that union gives me really good health care. And under the single payer system, I, I'd, I'd lose that health care. And I said, that's right, you probably would. And I, so I said, well, what else didn't you agree with uh, Bernie on? He said, free college. He goes, the Democratic Party's got to stop being the party, everything for free. And he pointed to his son, who was about 10 years old. He says, maybe my son should do what I did, which is go in the union, learn a trade, 
because it's worked out well for me. Why do we have to force everyone to go to college? So I said to him, so you like Bernie? He says, yeah, I love Bernie. I said, that was Bernie. I said, if you were to do a word association game and say Bernie Sanders and people had to say something, they'd say single payer or they'd say free college. And then he said two things to me, one that was really smart and one that was really insightful. So the thing that he said that was really smart is he looked at me, he said, well, none of that stuff would have happened anyhow, which we all know is, is probably true. And then the insightful thing he said is he said he was being really honest and I really felt like he was talking to me about things that really matter in my life, about the priorities in my life. And I learned so much from that encounter about the 2016 election. And then we went on and we, we chatted. He wanted to know what I thought about some of these issues. So he asked me about health care. And I told him, I think everyone should have health care. But I don't think single payer is necessarily the right way to do it. Health care is three things. It's access, quality, and cost. And single payer may be good for access, but it's not so good for quality or cost, in my opinion. You know, probably very similar to an answer Ami Barrow would give, a great new dem. And then we talked about kind of college versus community college versus career and workforce and technical training. You know, probably a kind of an answer Scott Peters would give. We had a nice conversation about that. And then we talked about kind of how we could bring our country together so that we could actually start doing some of these things. And then at the end of the meeting, he invited me to, to go over to his house at some point in the future and have a house party where he would invite all his friends to meet in the living room, presumably where Bernie Sanders had the house party. And what was interesting about that is here is a diehard, self-professed Bernie Sander, Sanders fan. And, and a fan of Senator Sanders for all the right reasons, by the way. All the right reasons. And yet he was inviting someone who was preaching the gospel of the New Dems into his house. And that really struck me for a minute. But then as I thought about it, it wasn't actually that surprising. Because even though the New Dems, we pride ourselves, rightfully so, on a lot of bold, exciting new policy ideas, thinking about the future, thinking about how the private sector and the government can work together for the good of our citizens. All of those policy ideas are built on a set of values that I actually think are enduring and very traditional American values. Civility, respect, competence in public service, seeing the other side of an argument, embracing kind of principled compromise to get things done, looking at the facts, thinking about the future, recognizing that the United States has a role in the world to do good and noble things, and that we need to engage economically and diplomatically. These are the things that the New Dem policy platform is built upon. And these are the things that really resonate with people. So I tend to think, in my experience, and again, I've had encounters with several thousand Iowans and New Hampshires at this point, and my colleagues here have this experience as well with their own constituents. My view is the conventional wisdom on where the Democratic Party is going is completely wrong. You know, Derek Kaufman and I, who I just met, were talking a second ago, that Wayne Gretzky line, you don't skate to where the puck is, you skate to where it's going. And I think where the puck is going in the Democratic Party is they're looking for people who can win, who can govern, and who can get real things done that matter to people like this union electrician. And that, to me, is our path forward. And we need a path forward because we're in a really tough spot right now. And I'm not just talking about the president. I'm talking about something that, in my opinion, is much deeper. And it's what hyper-partisan politics is doing to our country, how it's tearing our country apart, how it's tearing our communities apart, and how importantly, and this is really relevant to the things we talked about here today at the New Dems, is how it's prevented us from doing anything. And I used to say one of my favorite expressions in my prior life in business was that the cost of doing nothing is not nothing. We pay a huge price when we fail to act, which is often not realized by elected officials. Look what's happened in the last several decades. We've become part of a global economy. That decision was strangely vilified in the last election. Yet the facts clearly favor the optimist. I mean, when I was born 55 years ago, about 20% of the world was interconnected globally, meaning most of the world lived kind of in remote parts of the world, not connected to each other. And the global poverty rate was 60%. Fast forward to today, 
80 to 90% of the world is interconnected globally, and the global poverty rate's down to 10 to 15%. That's billions of human beings lifted out of poverty. If that's not the hand of God, I don't know what is. And we've seen it here in our own country. Innumerable benefits associated with being part of a global economy. But it wasn't positive for everyone. It wasn't positive for everyone. Huge parts of our country were left behind. And we knew this would happen, and we didn't do anything about it. Why? Because too many people in elected office put their political party ahead of their country, and they don't work to get things done. And it's going to happen again. I mean, the last several panels have focused on this. It's not going to be globalization this time, because that's done. The toothpaste is out of the tube on that. But it's going to be technological innovation, automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all the things you heard about today. It's fundamentally changing everything. It's changing our society, the structure of our society. It's changing the future of work and the current state of work, as one of the panelists said very smartly, I thought. It's changing our demographics. It's changing our security risks. You know, these are, these are massive kind of seismic changes in terms of the effect it'll have on our country. And is the government really spending any time talking about any of these things, projecting where the world is going and doing anything about it? No. And what that puts at risk is what it's already kind of put at risk, which is something that I think is about as central to the American identity as anything, which is this notion of the American dream. That if you work hard, you play by the rules, you have a shot. There's no guarantee, but you have a shot. There's a sense of your birthright doesn't matter. Right? You don't have to be born into the right family. And that's very personal to me as it is to so many of you. I mean, I was born in a blue collar family. My, my dad was an electrician, as I said. Neither of my parents went to college. I grew up in a town where that was the profile of everyone. But life was good. He got paid pretty well, my dad. We had good health care from the union. When I went to Columbia University, something that changed my life, my dad's union paid for half of the, my tuition. I would have never been able to go to that school but for that labor union. I remember when I was taking my first company public on the New York Stock Exchange. It was 1996. I was 33 years old. I was the youngest CEO in the history of the New York Stock Exchange at the time. And I remember looking across the river at Jersey City, New Jersey, which is basically where I'm from, and thinking about my dad's electrical union, which the local was based in Jersey City, Local 164. I used to have to go there every summer and thank those electricians for reaching into their pocket every week and throwing some money in a hat to create a scholarship fund. And what they were giving me was an opportunity that none of them had. None of them had the opportunity I had. And they were totally happy about it. I could see Ellis Island, where one of my grandparents came as a boy, with his seven brothers and sisters. And they were all let in except, except for him, because he didn't have, he only had one arm. And back then, we didn't let people into this country with disabilities. We had a merit-based immigration system. So he was a little boy, and he was detained at Ellis Island, and they sent him over to Staten Island uh, to be sent back home. But he got an appeal. And the appeal was held in the Great Hall of Ellis Island, and he used to tell the story. There were hundreds of people there speaking all kinds of languages, and he was in the back of the room, little boy, he was probably terrified. And then the judge walks in, and as the judge is putting on his robe, my grandfather sees the judge has one arm. And that's the only reason he was led into this country. But these are the stories of the American dream. The grandson of the one-arm immigrant, the only job he could get was at a pencil factory in Jersey City, New Jersey, making Joseph Dixon pencils. The son of an electrician gets opportunities to live a better life, get a good education, become a successful entrepreneur, and now have the privilege of serving in the Congress of the United States with all these wonderful new Dems. But these stories are diminishing in our country right now. Right now, about 70% of the children in the United States of America live in a county where there's no evidence of any upward economic mobility. That means in those counties, the jobs that are getting created are not as good as the jobs that are getting lost. So unless you're exceptional, unless you're Derek Kilmer, it's very hard to break out of that. Yet at the same time last year, 80% of the professionally managed venture capital in the United States of America went to 50 counties. There's 3,000 counties in this country. 50 of them got 80% of the professional, quote, smart money, yet 70% of the kids 
live in a county where there's no evidence of upward economic mobility. This kind of disparity of economic opportunity, because that's what it really is, it's a disparity of economic opportunity, is stunning, is stunning. And we allowed it to happen because we allowed the fringes in our parties, as Arthur Brooks said in a good speech yesterday, the fringes in our party have held the rest of the country hostage. And we haven't been able to do anything, right? We haven't been able to update the basic institutions in our society based on how the world changes, which is the fundamental job of government. Our job is to look into the future and envision a world that is more prosperous, more secure, and more just based on what's happening in the world and adjust based on that. That doesn't mean make government bigger. That doesn't mean make government smaller. It means adjusting the institution so that people are supported because every person in this country and every family deserves their shot of living the American dream. But they need a country who cares about that. And we failed. Listen, we all know that this is a magnificent country, magnificent in every way, right? We have freedom and liberties that no one else in the world enjoys. We have the rule of law, which is still holding. We have free and open capital markets. Everyone wants to invest in the United States of America. We have the best universities. We have a pioneering and entrepreneurial spirit that is the envy of the world. Most people in the world, if they had their chance, they'd come to the United States of America. You couldn't have more blessings for the 21st century. You couldn't have more blessings for the 21st century than what we have right now. But we do have one problem. Our problem is, is we don't have a government that's leading us and partnering with our citizens and our private sector and in our nonprofit sector in actually doing the things we need to do to prepare our citizens for the future. Right? Americans are being turned against American. Too many politicians for their own political ambition are allowing the core functions of government and democracy to break down. And there's too many people putting their political party ahead of the good of the country. Which is why I believe the central question facing our country, more than any particular set of policy, more than healthcare policy, more than education policy, more than any of these things, is how do we take this terribly divided and fractured nation and begin to bring it back together again? Right, which is hard work. Right, we, we all teach our kids that in life, we, you come at these kind of inflection points and you could take the easy path or the hard path. It's always better to take the hard path when you look back. And this is where we are right now. The easy path is to continue with the partisan demonization. The hard path is to do what the country really needs, which is to bring us back together and make the American people believe that there's something greater that we're all in on, right? That each one of them has a role to try to unify our country so that we can be stronger and more confident. And the way to do that is through the pathway of the new Dems, right? Because the new Dems don't talk about half of the country as if it's entirely wrong about everything it believes, which most Americans know isn't the truth, right? Most Americans, when you talk to them, when I'm out there talking to folks and, and all my colleagues are out talking to folks, they have friends, people they go to church with, people they work with, who are on the other side of the aisle, and they think they're good people. If you listen to the political parties, you don't hear that at all. So the New Dems have a very different approach to how they govern and how they approach. And they bring new ideas. I mean, and some of them seem fairly obvious, but you have to be intentional. Some of the things that I'm talking about is only doing bipartisan bills in our first 100 days. Wouldn't that be remarkable? I mean, there are hundreds of extraordinary bipartisan ideas that good-minded members on each side of the aisle have worked on for years. Wouldn't it be extraordinary if a president said, in my first 100 days, to prove to you, the American people, that I represent every one of you, whether you voted for me or not, I'm going to work on these things that both parties agree with. Wouldn't it be amazing if the president actually debated the Congress once a quarter and said to the American people, we're having a problem with the truth in this country. The political parties haven't been honest with you. You deserve an, a debate between the president and the Congress on the most important issues of the day televised nationally. Wouldn't it be amazing if the president called for national service 
all the kids who graduate from high school, who can't make it mandatory, but giving them the incentives to actually serve their country, either through the military or doing community service, and maybe we give them a break on their student loans, and we encourage universities to provide a preference to accepting those kids. Or if they don't want to go to college or they don't want to serve the military, have them rebuild the country in a new infrastructure program that we partner with the private sector with and we get the unions involved so these kids get a skill. Because that's a problem we have in this country. As you know, we have a huge skills gap. And this is the kind of thing that could bring us together. Bring us together. It would be something we could be proud of. And these young people would realize that when they're mixed with kids from all over the country of different backgrounds, different socioeconomic profiles, different ideologies, different races, everything, that they'd realize they have a lot more in common than what differentiates them. That's the kind of thing we need in terms of new leadership. And if we can actually get that kind of leadership, then we can start doing the kind of things we know we need to do, the kind of things we talk about as new Dems, which is taking care of these huge parts of our country that have been left behind. And there are ways of doing that. One of the ways of doing that actually passed in this recent tax bill. It's something that the new Dems were incredibly focused on, which is this Distressed Investment and Opportunities Act, which creates a great incentive for private investors to invest in these communities. That was a bipartisan idea. That was a bipartisan idea, and it's going to work. But we need to do more. We need to invest infrastructure in these communities, because it's not just private capital. They need public capital. And then we need to create incentives for there to be more demand in these communities. We ought to tell our government contractors that as a condition to getting a government contract, you need to put a lot of your workers in these places. We can turn all these communities around. Not, maybe not all of them, but most of them. And then we can focus on the future. Then we can talk about the things that are happening in the world that you heard about here today how these things are changing dramatically and how we basically need a new social contract. We need to educate our kids differently. The K through 12 education system, which was designed actually in 1892 by a group of progressives called the Committee of 10, who were thinking about what education kids needed for the 20th century. We haven't really changed that. Obviously for the 21st century, every kid should start a pre-K and they should get something after high school. I call it pre-K through 14, whether it be community college or skills training. Healthcare and retirement shouldn't be linked to your job. I mean, we talk a lot about the gig economy, but if you make it even simpler for the American people and you say, listen, my dad had one job. He was a union electrician. He did it for 60 years. How many jobs do you think people in the future are going to have? And they say four, five, six, ten. Your health care and your retirement obviously shouldn't be linked to your job if you're going to have all these jobs in the future. You're also going to need to be trained across time. And so we're going to need new institutions between the private sector and the public sector to train people. So once we come together and actually can agree on the facts and agree on our common purpose, we can actually start doing these things. We can reestablish our role in the world as the nation that has to be part of every important conversation in the world. And I think the Democratic Party is ready for that message. I just listened to the prior panel. Again, I've had interactions with several thousand Iowans and New Hampshireans across the last seven, eight months. I have brought up my support for the Trans-Pacific Partnership explicitly in 90% of these meetings. And I have said why I supported it, for the economic case for the country and for the geopolitical case for the country. And I don't get any pushback. We're misreading the party. And then we can deal with our fiscal trajectory and we can deal with all of the things we need to do. So I just wrote a book. When you run for president, you have to write a book. That's what everyone tells you, like within three days of announcing. And so it's not out yet, and I don't mean to plug my book, but the title I think is relevant. I am probably plugging my book here a little bit. I really do want the book sale, so. Um, it's called The Right Answer. And it comes from a speech that John F. Kennedy gave in 1958, where he said, we shouldn't seek the Democratic answer. We shouldn't seek the Republican answer. We should seek the right answer. We shouldn't seek to fix blame on the past. We should own our responsibility for the future. And that was written 60 years ago. And it was written in a speech where then Senator Kennedy was talking about how the United States was falling behind in the space race. And how he said, then the Soviet Union, was making all kinds of investments in their future. Whether they were or not, in hindsight, they probably weren't. And he, it was a call to action 
to get the American people to start thinking about big things and not get so caught up in where these ideas came from. And it's really the perfect roadmap for what we need today. And it's really what the new Dems talk about. It is really what the new Dems talk about, which is how do we focus on the future, which is our responsibility? How do we build a society that's more prosperous, more just, and more secure, which is our job, based on what's actually happening in the world, based on the real trends in the world, and how do we do things that actually affect what people care about, which is their job and their pay, and importantly, the opportunities for their children. How do we do that? And not worry about where the ideas come from. Not worry about where the ideas come from. So that we can once again become a nation of opportunity and not one of birthright. Because on our current trajectory, you're gonna to have to be born in the right city or go to the right school or the right family to have a shot. And those stories all end badly. When I first ran for office, I met a young woman who uh, was a teenager. She was part of a teenage Democratic club in Silver Spring, Maryland here. And she had immigrated to this country from Nigeria with her mother when she was three years old. And her mother cleaned um, hotel rooms. And they lived in Silver Spring in a small apartment. And she told me the story how every morning she and her mom sat at this little tiny kitchen table and her mother would grab her hand and hold it tight and say to her, dear, don't worry about anything that happens today because you're in America, the land of opportunity. And those kind of conversations are having with a fifth generation boy in Iowa, with a kid in Texas, with a kid in inner city Chicago, they're happening everywhere. That's what's core and central to our identity as Americans. And if we actually follow the New Dem roadmap, follow the New Dem roadmap, think about where the world is going, figure out how we can work with people to get it done, and fulfill our responsibility as elected officials. And if everyone in this country has some ownership associated with that, and feels an inspiration to do it, then all of those extraordinary advantages, all of those blessings we have as a nation, will have nothing stopping them from creating the better future that we will inevitably have. And that's why I'm so proud to be a New Dem. And that's why I said what brings the New Dems together is not just these shiny, well thought out, fact-based policies, but it's this underlying belief that our job as public servants is to actually do what I just described. And that's why it's a blessing to be part of them. And that's why I'm so grateful Derek and Scott and Jim and JD and everyone else had me here today uh, to chat with you. So thank you all and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.